hi everybody this is really exciting um so happy to be here and to be talking with you all today um we are going to have an amazing conversation um and so happy to see all of these people joining and, and writing in the chat. Um, I am Natasha Hoskins. I am one of the co-founders of Boys Club. Um, we are a social collective bringing new voices to the new internet, and I will be the moderator of our panel today. So uh, we're going to dive right in. One note, definitely feel free to utilize the chat. Uh, I would love to take some questions from the audience as we get into it here, so definitely feel free to jump in there. Um, okay, so I'm going to dive right in um, and get started with talking uh, with our panel today. So we're talking about empowering creators today, um, building communities, platforms, and new economies in the NFT ecosystem. Uh, we're going to be focusing on how NFTs are used today, used today to empower creators um, and how we expect that to change um, and evolve the creator economy in the years to come. So we have an absolute, like, just all-star panel of, uh, of people here today to talk about this, some real heavy hitters. Um, so I'd love for everybody to introduce themselves um, and share a little bit about uh, where they're from. So if we want to start, Betty, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Sure, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's weird to be here in like the best way. I'm looking at dancing apes and little mushroom guys. Um, oh, hey, Yamo. Shout out to the hod, anyone in the audience that's listening. Um, I am the co-founder and CEO of Dead Fellas. Um, and it's great to be here. I love on cyber. Uh, and Saren is here. Hi, Saren. Hey, everyone. Oh, my God. I love I love my, my community. Um, so, yeah, say it. I just want to say how uh, how happy I am to be here and how cool I think this is. I think that the accessibility level of this is really, really awesome, uh, especially considering we have all of these conferences that are so expensive and, you, you know, not everyone can get to them. So, yeah, really cool to be here. Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks, Penny. Um, okay, great. Um, Richard, are you here? Do you want to give yourself a little intro? I believe you're... Hey, hey how's it going? Hello? Hi, yeah, we can hear you. Do you want to give a, a bit about yourself and, and Manifold and what you're building? Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Richard, I'm one of the co-founders of Manifold, uh, also one of the organizers of Not NFT yet, NYT alongside on Cyber and AOTM. So glad everyone showed up and happy to, be, happy to, happy to see everyone here. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the co-founders of Manifold and what Manifold does is that we provide tools for creators in Web3 to really help them like realize what creative sovereignty means. And so, you know, we started off as providing independent sovereign smart contracts to creators. Um, and then we started expanded off uh, into providing more tooling around, you know, minting NFTs, uh, selling NFTs, and really just creating and get, really gauging experiences for NFTs. And so a lot of what we do is provide kind of no code tools for creators to, you know, le like leverage Web3 uh, in their own way. And we also provide tools for developers to create really like really interesting experiences on top of those NFTs. So yeah, happy to be here alongside this great, amazing panel here. And this is a very unique experience. So happy, uh, shout out to OnCyber for putting this together. Cool, great, thanks so much. Uh, okay, Ben, are you here with us? Do you want to give a um, yeah, I'm about yourself? Sure. Hi, how's it right. going? Connection. If, can you hear me well or not? Because I'm in the hotel. I don't know what's the connection at all. Yes, so maybe you can... we can hear you. Ah, okay, cool. Okay, no, so I'm Ben, one of the co-founders of Artifact. I don't know what I'm doing here. I just came because Ryan told me, can you come? And I said, yes, because Ryan <laughs> is the best, one of the best guys in the business. Uh, he's always trashing me that I say everyone is the best, but Ryan is truly the best. Uh, and it's cool to see all these um, avatars uh, moving around, including some apes and some clones and a bunch of different ones. I don't know what's the giant one that's dancing. It's super cool as well. And I like how we're here, like... Uh, judging people you know <laughs> as if all as part of a council and uh so yeah i'm happy to be in that space with uh, as well some people i know so uh looking forward to chat about whatever i want to chat. great cool thanks so much uh, okay and lee are you with us are you here can you hear me hi yes awesome yeah it's great to be here um thanks so much for having me 
I, yeah, I'm Leah. I'm one of the general partners at Variant Fund. We're an early stage Web3 investment firm, um, have also been creating for many years on the internet, NFTs amongst other things as well. Um, yeah, really glad to be here. This is a very cool space. I, I've never um, done a panel in a hoodie before, so this is a first. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, great. Well, super uh, happy to be here with you all and would love to jump right in. So Betty, I'd love to start uh, with you. Um, you are obviously at the forefront of this work at, uh, this work, and um, would love to hear from you how you feel like Deadfellows approach to providing tooling, assets, licensing rights, empowers uh, community members to become creators themselves. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, that is the it's one of the foundational um, aspects of, of the whole project and brand. Um, and it, it comes really from our own experiences as creators, Psych and I. Um, Psych is my co-founder. For anyone that's listening and doesn't know, he's also my husband and artist on Dead Fellas. Um, we really see this space as an opportunity to solve real problems and there are very real problems uh, that exist in the creative industries. I feel like also there's an issue with the everyday person not feeling like they have the license or opportunity to be creative themselves. I think we all have trouble owning that label. Um, when you ask someone if they're an artist or a creative, sometimes they'll say, oh, no, not me. I don't, I don't draw. I don't do this. I don't do that. Uh, well, I think that's actually kind of garbage and we're all creative uh, in our own ways. For me, providing the tools and resources for people to explore that is important. And you see it often, like we'll have, if we do have um, art contests or whatever, I always, every single time get messages uh, from people like, oh, I've never actually tried to do anything like this. I've never tried to create anything. And, um, and this is my first time. And oftentimes it's just an amazing an amazing um, result. So when we look at applying that sort of thing to Web3, it's like, okay, so we're looking at builders like the people at OnCyber, um, people at World Wide Web, like all of these different metaverse spaces uh, for people to congregate and to come together. How do we facilitate people to explore that using the IP that they own through Deadfellas? Um, it is through developing all of these different iterations of dead fellas, getting that library as big as we can so that people really have the flexibility to see what they can create with the IP that they have. Um, there's so much more to that. I mean, you know, there's people in our community that do amazing, amazing things, but the infrastructure and the framework isn't there uh, to get proper support from the project, from the community to amplify things, get connected with brands, get connected with, you know, where, whatever they need. Um, and so that's what we're building right now, uh, which is, is really exciting and, and I cannot wait. Cool. That's amazing. Um, I'd love for you to just expand a little bit about, to bring it to life for, for the audience here. Could you share some of the projects uh, that have come out of your community, like some examples of, of creators within your community and what they've built with the IP of DevOps. Yeah, so there's people that have created um, like characters in their own worlds that they've made. So there's a project called Rumblers that is just so impressive to me. Um, and there's a dead fella character in that, um, which is awesome. It's like a stop motion type thing. Um, there is a band called Paris, I believe it is, that has the dead fellas in it, uh, Space Blends character in there. So cool. And But then there's a lot of people that have just turned themselves into kind of, I guess, people within the community that people turn to for things. So uh, people like Chanel uh, in our community, everyone in dead fellas knows who Chanel is because Chanel was creating um, derivatives for people uh, just constantly every single day um, and and it it turned into a thing Chanel is widely widely loved uh, now but people do that always in the community as well Saren one of our mods um, also does incredible derivatives we've got Luma uh, Luma turned the derivative model into a whole like 
complimentary project which was really cool um and made like rooms for dead fellas that were in the in the back uh in the background that you could use for your, your pfp um dead decor which was so amazing as well people just do cool stuff um yeah. and i'm excited to really encourage that more and more and to be able to support it uh more and more because it i mean these people are co-creating um mm -hmm. dead fellas with us right like as much as there is centralized leadership like the community really do have reign on where they take it and they're using that and i, I think that's just so cool to see yeah that's amazing i think what's so interesting about what you're describing is this real sense of ownership that the community has, uh, which is, I think, a requirement of the world that we are all talking about, where this, uh, the creator economy is continuing to evolve and, and use the tools of Web3, that sense of ownership feels really, really important to that. And Lee, you just wrote a piece uh, for the Harvard Business Review that really expands on this sense of ownership. Uh, really further into psychological attachment. I'd love for you um, to talk a little bit about how you think creators really engender a sense of psychological ownership amongst their holders. Yeah, I think it's, oh. it's, it's 7 a.m. for Betty. She said, you sure you want to ask questions like this? <laughs> <laughs> We're going, deep, we're going deep right away. Oh, our business review said that. What do you think, Betty, at 7 a.m.? <laughs> Come on, Betty. Benoit. I'm sharing for you, Betty. <laughs> oh, Ricky's here up but early. It was that, that question was for me, right? Or was that for Benoit? That was for Lee. That was for Lee. That, was, that question was for Lee. It's a Betty panel now. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm Betty, myself. feel free to take it away. <laughs> I'm meeting myself. I'm meeting myself. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So I, yeah, as, as mentioned, I recently wrote this piece about psychological ownership. Um, the TLDR is basically that crypto has introduced digital asset ownership to the internet. Previously, you couldn't really own anything on online platforms. And now we have ownership that's tracked via blockchains for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually independent of a feeling of ownership among people. Um, and when I say a feeling of ownership, I mean that kind of psychological or emotional attachment that you might feel towards different things that you own or different um, objects that you possess. And in the offline world, this feeling of ownership is actually independent of legal ownership. So people might feel a lot of ownership over things that they don't actually technically own. In fact, um, for instance, you might feel a sense of ownership over your local park or your local restaurant, or you feel ownership over um, your playlists or your social media profiles when in actuality you don't own those things. But certain product experiences in the digital realm have helped you cultivate that feeling of ownership. And in this piece, I explore what are all the drivers of that feeling of ownership. It includes things like mastery, control, um, uh, self-object congruity, which is you're able to see your own values and self-image reflected in the thing that you own. Um, there's all these different drivers of psychological ownership. And in this piece, I basically argue that to make Web3 more of a sustainable ecosystem for projects to actually cultivate a group, a, a healthy community, um, it's critical to not just turn them into owners, de facto owners. Um, it's important to actually have that sense of psychological attachment too. I think this is the reason why Web3 has been um, criticized as being rife with speculation or there's projects that have explosive growth that then really quickly unwinds. It's because people have been made into owners without that corresponding feeling of ownership. And so they don't really have any sort of loyalty or retention with those projects. Um, two years ago, I actually tweeted a reminder to not conflate a group of people with economic incentives with a healthy mm -hmm. community. Those are two different things. And I think in crypto, we've done this very intense exploration of economic incentives without necessarily cultivating that healthy community. And I think psychological attachment um, is one of the key determinants of that. So 
in terms of your question of how can creators build this among their fans, I think it's about um, like tapping into all of those drivers of psychological ownership. So making them feel like they have control, like they're co-creating that world, um, making them feel like they have mastery over the experience of whatever product that you're building. Um, standing for a set of clear values and mission that people can see themselves in um, is another component of this. So those are some ideas. Wow. Yeah, I love that. I think um, I'm curious if you, how important you think actual like owner of licensing rights is to that feeling of psychological ownership. Do you think that those things have to be um, match or do you think that there are these other levers that you pointed to that give that sense of ownership, that sense of belonging in a community that is much deeper than just economic incentives? I think it's not necessary at all to tie okay. in like offline or analog experience of, experiences of ownership into digital assets to get people to feel ownership. I think mm -hmm. you can see this in, for instance, the music NFT space where the music NFTs that have done the best or gained the most adoption are on platforms or they don't have any tie-in to royalties or like what the song is actually earning yeah. through other channels and people instead are collecting or feeling a sense of ownership because they just want to feel like a patron they want to feel like they're close to the artist so i think we can explore like there's much more exploration for entirely like digitally native ways to give people that sense of ownership without necessarily tying it to a financial value proposition. Mm, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, okay, Ben, I'm coming to you. So I'm I'm giving you I'm prepping you so that you can know, even though it's so early your time. Um, I no, for me it's late. It's 11 p.m. So oh, it's 11 p.m. Okay, yeah. we've got a 7 a.m. Yeah. and 11 p.m. We're global. This is a global panel. Um, I mean, on cyber is a global platform, you know. So exactly, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so one of the things that as we're talking about uh, this sense of like psychological ownership and um, identity and that really, though, that type of topic brings up for me a sense of belonging. And when I think about digital fashion, I think that this is a huge reason why people are interested in digital fashion because to have that full sense of belonging and identity um, online and in their digital worlds, they people want to be able to represent themselves um, fully and fashion is such a huge part of that for people. So for you and Artifact, um, I'd love to hear how Artifact is, is leveraging NFTs to empower creators um, and really redefine that, di that definition of digital fashion and the landscape um, around that. I'd love for you to talk about how you see that now and sort of how you see that evolving over the next few years. Mm, uh, so there's, I mean, there's lots of ways to answer that, but the first thing is when we started Artifact and, you know, a lot of the core team have been working in fashion before, and me, what I always thought that was a bit untapped potential in fashion brands that they, they are really, you know, always leveraging things that are ephemeral and fashion is by default ephemeral, even though a lot of stuff is mm -hmm. coming back and, you know, they take back in the archive and bring it back and, but they always need to be on top of what's new and get the latest, uh, you know, cultural trends defined in the street and then embed that in their big corporation or big industry if it's a big brand. And and same in the model industry where they all try to always get the the latest hot models. And usually, you know, they all compete together to try to find who's the next model. And this you could have seen recently. I think there's two big examples recently, both coming from Korea. One was after the the Squid Game, you know, TV show aired. Mm -hmm. They all try to sign that girl. I don't remember what number she has in the in the TV show, but a super cool Korean girl. Mm -hmm. And they all signed her, and you could see that you know LV signed her on the luxury side, that and uh, Adidas signed her on the the sportswear side. Like she got signed in every possible vertical you can think of a fashion and lifestyle brand. And you could have seen that as well recently with the new K-pop band called the New Jeans, where I think the fashion brand learned quite fast from their 
the fact they got quite slow with Blackpink, but then they still got, you know, managed to get each one of them in each different brand. And they jumped on it as soon, you know, as they started to become popular a bit outside of Korea or even in Korea. They all signed each one of them and the five of them. And you had always thought that was a, that was a lot allowing with NFTs and, you know, the fact that you, you start the fashion brand in the digital world and not in the physical one, is that you could go beyond just selling clothes and having to, you know, invent new clothes every season and do all these things and always be on the ephemeral side and actually offer your audience something they can really own and be. And you could actually, instead of using models that uh, you source and you try to always stay on top, you start to give people their online identity that then they can customize and you know use for whatever they want to, to be their online persona. And so that was the first thing we did, which was a fashion brand in the future can actually also have avatars as part of its product line and then let people become their own model. And if you let people own that identity, own their commercial rights and have their 3D files and, and think of them of people who are actually creative and active and not passive, uh, then they can actually, you know, become your role models for the brand and, and you don't need to always try to be on top of what's the next hot thing in the real world. So that's the main thing I think we did and that uh, the community embraced very fast. Still one of the things we're the most proud of today is the fact that we have the most creative community in the space. And if you compare it to even traditional fashion brand, I don't think there's any fashion brand that has that many people actually creating things for that brand or using that brand logos or what that mm -hmm. brand is doing. So, and I think it's very, very important because we always started the company thinking that first, I never wanted the company to be huge in terms of employee count because I hate to manage people. Uh, and I hate uh, to have a lot of things to manage. It's really the worst thing to to manage people. That's why we only take really good people and try to keep the team small and only take people who are super good at what they do or super self-motivated and they can learn from the more senior ones. Always doing a mix of very junior and very senior, uh, not many mid-levels. And then also because we thought that whatever we do anyway, like the community will be better than us uh, by combining their strength. So it's that thing of always thinking of your audience of people who are smart, actually smarter than you, uh, and mm -hmm. potentially together more creative than you. And this actually we see it every day, like there's people creating amazing things. And then your role as a fashion brand is more to educate them, give them the tools to create and create more easily or to connect together. And that's thing we've done a lot so far by distributing 3D files, which as you can see now are finally usable on cyber. Thank you, Ryan, for taking so long, but it was also our fault of not doing the VRM, but it was tough to make from the initial 3D pipeline we did the clones with, but now it's done. So it's cool to see some clones in the crowd and my clone sitting in that uh, judgmental conference council we have here in the city um, but mainly yeah, I expect to see more and more things done by the community and and at yeah. some point you know they will be the one creating most of the things for artifact and uh, yeah. be the one defining what artifact is more than us at some point if we do the work well yeah um, really interesting so what I'm hearing from you is traditional brands and consumers fashion brands, the way that consumers or someone like myself relates to a brand is this very like aspirational relationship because you have the next biggest model, the next biggest star representing your brand. That's the work that brands do. They go and they find like the next hot thing, they bring them onto the brand and it becomes this like aspirational relationship to uh, whatever, whatever it is, whether it be, you know, Gucci or Chanel or whatever the luxury brand is. Um, and sort of what you're drawing a line to is now consumers can, are empowered to create uh, through projects like yours, their own avatars, their own brand identity. Um, and that shifts the relationship from sort of aspirational to another person and celebrity of some kind to being able to form your own world and, and create the world that you want to see through your own avatar and, and the things that you can produce through um, a community and, and brand like uh, 
artifact, which is really interesting. And then the other thing you spoke to is really this idea of like tooling and infrastructure and what's necessary for people to be able to do that. And I want to talk about Manifold and get into that, but I know Lee um, has a shorter timeline here. So I'm going to come back to you quickly Lee, before you have to, to bounce um, at starting to dig into this question of tooling and infrastructure. I think one thing that we think a lot about for NFT communities is how important it is uh, to choose the right digital mechanisms for their creators and their community to create engagement and value. Uh, and this is a big question for communities. So in this vein, I'm curious uh, how you think about how should projects think about fungible tokens versus NFTs in terms of giving users ownership and increasing sort of this long-term sustainability for communities. You could speak to that uh, before you have to bounce. Yeah, um, I think this is a really big and important question and one that a lot of projects um, are grappling with, like a, a lot of projects that I talk to that are thinking about decentralizing ownership or exit into their communities are thinking. About yeah, I asked you a very, a, a very big question in, in a very <laughs> short amount of time. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. for sure. Fungible tokens versus NFTs. I mean, I think like I was talking to someone yesterday who told me that humans have like out of all of our senses, we have the, the most number of visual receptors out of any kind of sensory receptors. And so we're just like naturally very visual beings and we resonate with visual things. And so I think you can see that in the success of NFT projects versus social tokens. Um, social tokens two years ago were widely predicted to be this um, type of asset that would allow people to bet on creators or invest in creators and people were predicting that every creator in a couple of years would have a social token. Turns out mm -hmm. that didn't happen and instead what we've seen is a prol proliferation of NFT projects that kind of function in the same way that social tokens were imagined to do. Um, so I think NFTs have the advantage of like helping people feel like they, they own something engendering that sense of emotional attachment. Um, but I think it's also harder for users to think about um, like valuation or pricing or like to understand economically what they own when every mm. asset is, you know, non-fungible. And so for projects that are thinking about launching a token, um, I think those are the trade-offs. Like a fungible token is much easier to reason about. Um, it doesn't result in that fragmentation of liquidity. Um, it perhaps allows you to have a much larger holder base than an NFT project would, although NFTs are also not constrained. Um, so this, those are some of the considerations. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for joining. Yeah, and thanks so uh, much for having me. I have to hop, but thank you all for being here. This is really fun. Great to have you. Uh, okay, so building building on sort of a, the toolkit for projects um, and NFT communities, uh, Richard, I'd love to go to you and, and talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about how Manifold is supporting creators right now. And could you explain a little bit how Manifold smart contract solutions offer creators more control of their NFT communities and really foster a greater sense of community engagement because of that? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think the one thing that, so when Manifold started, our whole thing was like, how do we offer as much creative control and pretty much power to every single creator out there? Um, you know, the State of the Union before Manifold, uh, Manifold came around was that most people, were, most creators were minting on these platform contracts. And mm -hmm. you know, issues with these platform contracts was that you're kind of beholden to the platform itself. And so, you know, there has been many cases where, you know, an artist had minted on a pop, like, for example, the OpenSea shared contract. And then all of a sudden, you know, OpenSea said, hey, you're, you're an artist from Iran or some country that is, has been embargoed. And then they just like completely wiped all of the NFTs from the artists, took down their storefront, took down the NFTs and even the metadata. And so those artists were kind of just like left without anything really. And so, you know, one of the big fundamentals of blockchain is that, you know, it, everything you, you own, it should be permanent. And so, you know, because they were minting on these contracts that, you know, they didn't own and had no control over, they were kind of beholden towards, you know, the rules of the platform itself. And so we said, well, you know, it doesn't make sense that that is the case, you know, coming from a, blo a blockchain background. Uh, and yeah, so we offer these credit, these credit contracts, right? And, you know, one of the big things is that we always strive to make sure our contracts are interoperable with as many uh, marketplaces out there. 
So manifold contracts are the only contracts that are, are accepted by, you know, the permission marketplaces like Nifty Gateway, uh, Foundation, Super Rare, and every other permissionless marketplace, such as, you know, um, OpenSea, Variable, um, you know, LuxRare, and so on. And, you know, it, what, what it really does is that when you own your credit, your own contract, it really enables you to do really unique things. And so what people have done with Manifold contracts specifically is that they've been able to extend the functionality of what they've been, of what they do. And, you know, that goes from cross of creating like really unique uh, NFT mechanics uh, to even like unique sales distributions, uh, ways to distribute their NFTs. And so, you know, what we're trying to do at Manifold is just really provide as much tooling as possible for creatives in Web3 to really utilize the power of the blockchain itself. And, you know, we do so in, you know, by providing contracts, by creating engaged, uh, interesting engagement things. You know, uh, you, can take, you can take manifold contracts, you can burn any NFT and create, to create new NFTs. That's been a really unique, unique experience for people. You can even take, uh, we have a bunch of token getting utilities. And so what you can do with the tokens is that you can create, uh, you know, different campaigns around like, uh, uh, trading them in for physical merch, uh, you know, getting information, uh, creating access to uh, digital content that is only accessible if you own the NFTs. And, you know, really what we're trying to do at Manifold is just create really interesting use cases for everyone. And we're really excited to see what, you know, people create with our tools. Cool. Um, yeah, that's exciting. I think it's so important to obviously build out infrastructure that makes it possible for more creators to uh, have possibilities in this space, non-technical creators to be able to plug and play with uh, a different set of tools that allow them to make their mark on this space, as well as still holding true to sort of the principles of Web3 that are so important to us. I think it's also really important to have that. Um, the more that we do this, the more these communities can have a sense of long-term sustainability and engagement and not just be sort of a flash in the pan if they can sort of easily take um, part of a project and build upon it in a new way with tools that make that easier to do. So I'd love uh, Betty to come back to you and talk a little bit about this idea of uh, sustained growth and vibrancy within a community over, um, over a long set of time. I mean, you are um, sort of one of the um, core NFT projects, one of the first ones I was exposed to. And so you have been done a really successful job of uh, being early and then building from there and still having a really vibrant community. And I'd love to hear about how you've done that. Um, and I know at the beginning you were talking a little bit about tooling and what you're building in order to uh, empower your community, but would love to hear about how you've been able to sustain growth and vibrancy and, and how you're planning to do that in the future. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think it comes down to being mission driven, right? Like, um, there's a lot of discussion on um, NFT Twitter around whether or not you should be outspoken or a project should have, you know, a strong, a strong value set um, and whatnot, in order to appeal to the widest range of people, probably. Um, probably that's true, but at the same time, when you're brand building and you're trying to solve problems uh, in the real world, to, ha to, to have a strong mission and to have a strong value set that is kind of woven through uh, the DNA of a brand and everything that it does results in far more stronger connections within the community and within from the community to the, to the brand itself as well. I'm a very big believer in that. I think that when we look at brand building in web two and compare that to what's happening here. We have this opportunity to create things of substance that, that do address real issues in the world rather than just being a brand for the sake of being a brand. I think that when you try and appeal to everyone, you dilute yourself to a point, whereas, you know, you, there are many, many, many people in the world um, and finding the people that are, aligned with what you want to do and the problems you want to solve is important. So part of the vibrancy of what's going on at Deadfell is, is because the people that are attracted to, to this brand um, share goals and, and share views. And while there's a, definitely a huge diversity of voice, age, gender, location, all of that, 
um, there is this common thread of uh, wanting something better for the world and wanting something better for creators and wanting to see innovation and push boundaries. And that is, uh, it's super cool. It's like this counterculture um, aspect that I just really hoped for when we mm -hmm. started this whole thing. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, part of that is, as I was speaking about before briefly, empowering people in our community to express themselves through what we're doing. So I'm excited to see some of this stuff come out. Um, the streaming avatars, streaming fellas for all of the 10K holders will be so fun because that's going to really empower people to create their own content and remain uh, anonymous if they wish, you know, create entire new identities around their their dead fellas, which is going to be real cool to see. Um, but yeah, I greatly, I mean, I greatly respect what Benoit is doing uh, with the the creator stuff in his community and Richard is a hero of mine I feel like Richard Richard and Manifold just really do uh, hold the line in terms of what we expect for what we present creators and how we empower them without that I just don't see I don't know where we'd be because people would be relying too much on uh on these centralized marketplaces and whatnot, but yeah. yeah. So props to these guys. Cause I'm, and the on cyber team, obviously. I love, I love the shout out. Um, so yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you is that mission driven aspect is essential to having an engaged and, and vibrant community in the long term, And that is something that you have had to balance sort of you have to balance against how do we grow sustainably while also holding true to our missions and value and su sustain that mission while also widening our community. Yeah, and to be honest, that hasn't been that challenging because mm -hmm. it isn't hard to find traditional brands that feel sick of building in the same space that they have been doing. So the collaborations that we've done with Web2 brands have been really, really fun. And, um, you know, you think about, oh, collaborating with a brand that's like a legacy br brand, like Wrangler, for example, you would think that we would be the ones trying to convince them of all of this crazy stuff. Like you guys, come yeah. on. <laughs> no, it was, it was actually the other way around. Like they were, they were the ones that were, trying to push and push and push, which I just thought was so, so cool. So you're seeing this happen in real time mm -hmm. as well, shift with brands um, towards this more innovative space. And um, that really pleases me a lot because I think consumers are just over it, like sick of being sold to, sick of being um, co-creating these brands with no reward. I, you see that yeah. in the luxury space constantly. So it's a real pleasure to change that dynamic. And I think that is sustainable growth. You know, I mean, there's obviously aspects of um, brand building that need to be addressed that you can do well or not do well. Uh, there's hype and attention and all of that stuff that goes on. The speculative nature of brand building in Web3 is crazy to me, um, but you do mm -hmm. have to go through it sometimes. It's a funny line. We're all kind of learning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very pleased with how Dead Bell is is uh, is operating in this space. It makes me really quite proud of where we've come and where we started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's very it's very exciting to hear, and I love hearing that more traditional brands are excited about it and looking for ways to innovate and ways to incentivize their um, their consumers and sort of transform consumers more into. Um, actual communities that uh, are part of co-creating brands. It's, that's a really exciting future. And coming back to some of the tooling stuff, I think what I'm hearing is this amazing ability to democratize the creative process, um, both as individuals and as sort of contributors to larger brands. And Richard, I'd love to talk a, a bit about uh, coming back to the tooling at Manifold, how do you see these smart contract solutions that you are all offering really be a, a mover in con contributing to democratization of the creative process? Yeah, you know, I think what we're doing at Manifold is just really giving access to everyone. Uh, you know, when we first started, you know, it was really hard to create our own smart contracts because no one really understood the technology. And on top of that, mm -hmm. too, there were a bunch of other as like providers out there who are just providing bad smart contracts. 
And, you know, there's, I remember back when I started, there's so many PIP projects out there that ended up having bad smart contracts that would end up, you know, running the community just because, you know, they weren't put together well or they were put down, put together very rushed and were tested very well. And so one of the things that we really strive for is just making sure that everything we offer Manifold is of the highest quality, it works well, it's well tested and very secure, very secure. And really what that does, it gives a lot of confidence for creators and their collectors and their communities to really trust what is, going for, what is happening going forward. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time on, you know, educating our creators, you know, teaching them proper wallet security, how to do things properly. And really we're trying to provide really good defaults for everyone too. So that, you know, they, you can, they can be assured that when someone deploys something on a manifold contract or uses manifold tooling, that it's really easy to use, but also you can trust that you're going to get something, a, a, a solid, solid quality product in the day. You know, when I think about the blockchain in general, it all comes back down to the, the technology and smart contracts are mm -hmm. sort of the foundational building blocks of everything we do in Web3. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I can speak from our experience at Voice Club, we're a deeply non-technical team. And even just over the course of the last year, what has been made possible with tools like Manifold for a community like ours have really unlocked a lot for us uh, in a way that was really not possible even you know a year, 18 months ago. Um, so I'm really so excited to see that. And I think uh, the ability for uh, non-technical people to be able to leverage a smart contract in a way that um, allows them to be a creator in this space is absolutely huge and, and is a huge part of um, how I see the future for this space. And I think coming back to some of the digital fashion stuff, I sort of see it as, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, when you look at a sort of fashion photography for, as an example, you see there was like 10 fashion photographers or like 15 fashion photographers that everybody used. Um, and then with the, um, with Instagram and with the evolution of social media, everybody with a smartphone and a good eye who had, who had talent was able to produce a beautiful image that they could share that could have distribution across Instagram. And then you saw this democratization really of who could participate in the, in the fashion space when it comes to photography and who could be a photographer and all these amazing creatives and artists were able to get exposure in a new way and really become participants in that industry. And I think we're starting to see that when I think about the future I want to see for digital fashion. Um, I think, I hope that that's what we're going to see there as well with digital designers being able to have new distribution, new access, uh, new exposure through, uh, through all that's being built in the space right now. So Ben, I'd love to hear from you. How do you see NFTs transforming the way creators are going to be able to monetize their work and engage with their audience uh, in the digital fashion space? So I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to go back to one whole thing you said where I got a strong okay. point. Okay, <laughs> great. I love it. I love it. No, go because for you it. mentioned. <laughs> no, but I think it's really good what you said because um, I think yeah, it's all about the democratization of access to actually be part of the art world. And I think the art world meet was one of the things that really interested me in the NFTs as a medium again, because once again, I really think that term is, is going to be cringe at some point to use. Uh, but the, I think the medium and the technology is amazing. But the art world was always very, very, very small. And only a few people could participate in. And if you go to some gallery openings or stuff like that, you always see the same people. Then after, more people started to get interested in the art because of Instagram or thanks to Instagram because it's cool content to post. And as well, a lot of artists and museums understood that by making more like immersive type of installation, just like the Yaokusama infinity rooms or stuff like this, like it became a lot more popular. But mm -hmm. what you said earlier around the photography, because I studied fine arts initially, and I was always very, very pissed off at the other students that just had a really good analogical camera and were taking honestly very shitty, boring pictures. <laughs> But just because it was an analog camera and they were developing it in the dark room and blah, 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 they thought it was cool or that it could be considered art when in the end it was just a shit picture taken with a really expensive camera. Uh, so that's why I love, you know, the fact that now you have smartphones and that anyone can take a picture whenever they want because they have, you know, 
the camera in their pocket that a lot of people on TikTok are becoming like super good editors and really mm-hmm. understand how to create content that people can really engage with. And I think NFTs in the end, it's not, it's not something that's going to, you know, make creation more accessible. But it's going to make the actual act of being able to leave or sell or make a business out of your creations a lot more uh, easy for everyone. And then that's why I'm so interested in tools like Blender for the 3D, which is on the open source or VR, I think is great to experiment stuff like that, but also to create 3D because it's quite hard to create 3D in a 2D environment in 3D softwares. Uh, that's why I think anything related to AI is also very interesting because it's going to give access to a lot of more people to bring to life their imagination. Mm-hmm. So I think in general, there's a big two things happening at the same time and there's a huge, huge new ways of creating and creative tools are becoming, becoming a lot more accessible, just like you mentioned the analog camera versus the smartphone camera. And at the same time, we're lucky because NFTs as a medium is allowing these creators to actually distribute their art instead of just trying to post it for free and then maybe do a Patreon or maybe get hired by an agency or be commissioned one day by someone. So it's going to really create a very big long tail of amazing creatives are going to make their own new, you know, transparent and ownable uh, ways of distributing the artwork and monetizing the artwork. So that's what I'm very excited about. Cool. And I'm yeah. not excited about people who have an analog camera who think they're photographers because they have an analog camera. Because <laughs> anyone can buy that, so it's fine. Um, yeah, that's, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I love the way that you put that, that there's this new, the NFTs are a mechanism to monetize the sort of democratization that's maybe already happened through, already happening or is happening through AI art, through our accessibility to um, iPhones or other ways to produce is a really great way of looking at it. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. So I'd love to get some audience questions um, and hear from those who are listening in. If you wanna drop them in the chat, um for our panelists here that would be amazing i see a lot of chat a lot of um 420 talk but would love a question or two for the audience if people have it uh, for the panelists if people have it um and while people are dropping those in um i i'd love for each one of you to sort of talk about the roadmap that you have i know a few of you have touched on it briefly but i think um, you know, obviously we're sort of in this bear market environment, but we're all building for the next bull run and thinking about where do we want to be and what do we want to have built um, when the next bull run comes. So would love to uh, touch base with all of you about your roadmap, what you're building. Um, Betty, I'd love to start with you. I know you were talking uh, a bit about this, but would love to get into more detail uh, of what's next for Decola. Yeah, totally. Um, so immediately we have the release of the streaming fellas avatars so people can stream, create content, be on Zoom, do their meetings, whatever you want um, yeah. as their dead fellas, which is awesome. And different versions of dead fellas being released in different environments. Um, we have a website refresh. We have our marketplace um, coming for all of our ecosystem. We have, um, oh, we have some really cool gaming stuff um, that I, that's all I can say, but it's fun. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the creator economy, it's like the, the DAO structure is being built right now as well. So there's a lot coming. We've got some really sick media and entertainment stuff happening as well that I, I can't say anything else about, but yeah. The future is very exciting with Dead Fellows, and I'm having a great time. Great, I, I love that. Uh, okay, <laughs> we'll take an audience question, and then we'll go to um, another uh, roadmap. But uh, we have a question here from Sudden Boom, who says NFTs have had a bad image for many people around the world. Um, how do you deal with uh, countries, I believe, who are against this? Does it make a problem to find collaboration does it make it i think what they're asking is does it make it difficult to collaborate with specific brands um would love to hear from any of you um on how you feel like sort of the mainstream conversation around nfts um, has shifted and how that's affected collaboration with more traditional brands 
I would uh, I will take this and I'd love to hear from Benoit obviously because he's got a very very unique experience with that um, I think that uh, it doesn't honestly it doesn't really affect us and I know that sounds a bit a bit silly but the the things going on behind the scenes and the brands that are involved in this space that people don't know about yet um it there just doesn't seem to be the friction there i think it's more convincing um huge institutions like uh of of the context and use case and that's going to take people like us all of us here today building use case for people to be able to see like how how and why this makes sense what's the point what is the problem that it's solving you know um, so that that's kind of what I see. I'd love to hear that from what you think, Benoit. What they think about the what? Um, uh, sort of how it. you've combated um, the the bad uh, press, like the bad um, yeah press that their rhetoric that there is around NFTs around the world. How that shift, if that's affected your collaboration with brands that are more traditional. Mm, I mean, not really, because, you know, us, we're lucky because a lot of the conversation we have with brands is with people we actually know from before, you know, it's personal network. Uh -huh. uh, and it's people who trust us personally more than the NFT space to start with. But for sure, the, the sentiment has changed, though, in, in the mainstream. Uh, I think because there was too much for too long and the press talked about it too much and just talked about the money and a lot of the main brands were like okay like what the fuck is this thing i don't understand like what well, these guys giving us lessons around uh, what's the future <laughs> and now they're quite happy to see that everything crashed and in the end it was just uh, forty thousand people having a big party <laughs> and they're happy to go back to their day-to-day -day business because most people they don't like change you know that's part of being a human being is the hardest thing it's the the thing you're, you're the most you know the unknown is what you're mo most afraid of uh, so I think a lot of brands are happy that in the end that change doesn't seem as big as it was said to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And even though me, I believe it's still a fundamental uh, change, but that's just going to take a lot longer to actually have an impact on more people. And and so I definitely I think the mindset changed and the main brands are still, you know, keen to do things unless you have, of course, like personal trust. Uh, it's people who either already made the team and committed, so either they have to fire these people or, or, they, or they, 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 can't, they, they can't do it. Uh, and mainly those who didn't make a move, like uh, the, the smart ones are still thinking about around the technology and how it can affect their business for the next five to 10 years. But yeah. uh, doing something with a brand just because most brands were driven by hype and FOMO. Uh, just like the space itself was a lot driven by hype and FOMO. So it's the same, you know, it's replicating everywhere. So us, it's different because, again, we have these personal things uh, with them, but, and, and we're owned now by a big brand, you know, so it's also in a mm -hmm. special position there. But I think that it's, it's, it's a bit sad in a sense that also the space is not giving itself any favor towards these type of things by mainly sometimes on you know on twitter like being driven by speculation or i saw me i'm, I'm in holidays these days so i'm not following too much what's happening on twitter but i saw recently everyone went crazy and everyone happy again because there's a the pepe coin or something like that mm -hmm. and and why are they happy because they all speculate on a on a weird pepe i love pepe as a character it's very funny i think but everyone is suddenly positive because there's lots of money on a, on a fake coin in an alternative universe right so all of this is not really helping if you want this to be considered seriously by these big brands. But also you don't need to because I still really, really believe that a lot of the change and next big things are going to be made by people no one knows about and by brands yeah. and groups of haters that are not, you know, not massive or no one doesn't exist yet. And I'm still a very, very big believer in this. But uh, I think clearly like, regarding normal brands like those who didn't make the move, like they, they are like, okay, thank God we didn't make that move because the press is not talking about it anymore. And most of mm -hmm. the ones who made move made it for, because of the press. And then and there's those who are smart and really analyze that on a more long-term technological level and how it can really affect their business, you know, in a big, big futuristic vision. These ones are still working and, and still doing really interesting stuff. But, uh, but for the most, most of them, uh, like now are like, okay, like NFT was a fact. Mm -hmm. 
That's why I think it's important that you don't use that term anymore. And I don't know if you saw, you know, Nike did their release and we had them and yeah. we were on their thing and they're not using the term NFT anywhere on the yeah. swoosh release. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, interesting. Cool. Well, that's, I love that perspective and I think it's useful uh, always for... Interesting and maybe controversial, but interesting. I always try to... <laughs> yeah, right. You, you succeeded. You succeeded. But, you know, <laughs> not all the time, though. <laughs> No, not that much because you need to translate what I say after apparently. So like, go ahead, because <laughs> maybe I say a lot of bullshit and I don't feel like. <laughs> um, okay, in our final minute here, I do want to hear uh, first from Richard. What's what's on the roadmap? Uh, how are you saying dynamic in this uh, ever changing uh, environment? Uh, and then we'll end with Ben for uh, what's next for Artifact. So Richard, um, what's what's on the roadmap? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to create like new innovative cases for NFTs. So one initiative we have going on right now is uh, EIP 6551, which are, it's really interesting. It's uh, NFTs that can own other NFTs. And another interesting fact about these NFTs is that they can also deploy smart contracts and own smart contracts too. So you can think of what the implications of that are from a, per a primitive perspective. And so mm -hmm. we're really excited to get that out there and see what kind of use cases the player community creates for those. Uh, on top of that, too, we're always working on new and innovative mechanics that you know, our player community can leverage. And we're also working on, you know, just how to display NFTs very differently. Uh, you know, so some of the stuff we're working on is, you know, on Cyber Included is how do we create, like, really dynamic NFTs that can be displayed in different environments, uh, you know, in-world, off-world, and, you know, in metaverses. And, cool. yeah, excited to see, you know, what people create once you kind of release these tools. Super, super exciting. Uh, okay, Ben, what's on the roadmap for Artifact? It's really, really, really cool. And I love how they've been building since day one and keep on building without talking too much. But the third they're doing is uh, really major, I think. And so what's your question, a roadmap? Yes, what's next for you guys? Uh, we don't, not talking about roadmap anymore, that's so 2021, honestly. Oh, you okay, I'm so, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I'm joking. I mean, I mean, oh. as usual, we have a lot of the next thing up next, you know, of course, is the Air Force One we've been teasing and uh -huh. they're releasing physically, you know, because again, we still do some physical things. I think it's still very important. Plus, no one yeah. else can do these shoes. So, like, yeah, they're, they're really, really, really crazy. We're doing that event with Takashi in like uh, nine days in Tokyo. We're going to reveal more about the Animus project and showcase a lot of really cool things and make a proper experiential event mixing digital and physical in Tokyo. Tokyo is cooler than NFT NYC, I think. So I'm happy we do this and not, not anything at NFT NYC. Uh, the, and um, what else? And then, you know, we continue, I don't know, people so recently, we finally released a dedicated website for the creators. We're working a lot on, you know, continuing to feature some. Now it's really easy for us with that website to update it. And the, actual, the creator mods are actually, you know, managing it, so it's great. Uh, more things on the 3D files, more things on how you can combine again, again around identity like AI with these 3D characters and how you can give more and more ways for people to continue to express themselves and be creative with their digital identities. It's stuff we always work on. So there's no precise roadmap for me you know, to explain to yeah. you right now, but we're always working, always thinking about the future and whatever the market is, uh, conditions, we are we're busy. Yeah, great. Well, thank you all so much. This was such an uh, enlightening panel and a great group of people who are building uh, really the future of what the space is going to look like. So thank you so much to um, Betty and Richard and uh, Ben and, and Lee. Um, you know and that the whole event, I thought you were calling me Benny. Benny? Oh, we're just such good like, friends. We're Benny. I was like, how the... <laughs> Yeah, I'm we're like, that okay, close. I'm gonna <laughs> take it. Uh, I'm gonna accept it. Okay, let's go.